Hello everyone and welcome to a very warm December's day in Glen Rowan. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of a video to take you through the site of the Notorious Siege um, as it currently looks uh, because it won't look this way for much longer. I'm currently sitting in front of a replica of the train station that was here back in 1880 um, looking towards the Glen Rowan Hotel which is a later addition um, approximately there-ish uh, was where McDonald's Hotel was um, frequently misattributed to McDonald's but um, that was what was known as the Sympathiser Pub and it played a role in the siege on the day in uh, 1880, well, days really. Um, but we're going to take a bit of a wander and have a look at some of the key locations um, that feature in my book, but were, you know, the main features of the siege that took place here in late June 1880. So let's talk about uh, the train station. So this spot where the current uh, replica train station is, um, is actually slightly different to where it was in 1880. Um, back in the day, the train line was a bit further towards that direction, so it was a little bit further out. Um, but they built a replica here to show what the station would have looked like back in the day of the siege. And obviously we've got these uh, bollards behind me that were at one point meant to resemble people who were here on the day. Um, but this train station um, was a very important part of what happened. After Ned was captured, this is uh, where he was kept for a little while, and you can see in some of the pictures from the day, people trying to look through the windows to see if they can get a view of Ned. Um, the actual station building uh, that was here actually was a lot longer than this, um, about this area here. Um, there would have been a storage shed um, which you can see in the the photos at the time and round about here would have been uh, a billboard where there was lots of advertising pinned up for people to have a look at but uh, this is where all of the police were stationed initially um, coming backwards and forwards from the battlefield it's where the journalists were stationed as they were watching they put a pile of saddles up so that they were able to, to look at what was going on with a reduced risk of being shot um, and then later on there was a set of scales on the platform which was used for measuring the weight of packaging and parcels uh, that was used to measure the weight of Ned Kelly's armour after his capture um, but obviously it was a very different looking building and slightly different location to what we have here now uh, this was built um, much much later and as Glen Rowan no longer has a functioning train station it is here purely as a little bit of a uh, curiosity for people who are interested in the history of the siege. So coming through this way um, under the pass here we can see that there's been a bit of landscaping and stuff done but here we are now looking out across at the battlefield now, obviously, it looked very different back in the day. Uh, far less buildings and foliage and all that kind of stuff. Um, but you get a reasonably good idea of the layout of the place as it was back then when compared to some of the photos. You can see in the distance over here uh, some bollards that were painted up to look like the uh, Queensland Native Police, the black trackers. Um, facing towards where the site of the inn was and uh, we'll take a closer look at that in a moment. Um, over this way is the police station which was later built over the spot where Ned was captured and uh, we'll have a closer look over there in a moment too. These bollards I believe are meant to be representative of Ned and Dan's sisters Kate and Maggie. Um, they're a little worse for wear now having been subjected to the rigours of time and the elements. Um, this stump over here was once Father Gibney, but he's now used as a trash receptacle. 
an unfortunate way to treat uh, a man of the cloth. You can see across the road here, uh, there's a playground and there's the Glen Rowan Hotel with a picture of Kate in the window up there um, and some dummies made up to look like the Kellys in their armour. This is the viewing tower that's being built. Now there's been a lot of sort of controversy around this over the last 12 months but essentially uh, this will be a kind of interpretive centre where visitors to Glen Rowan will be able to go up to the top and use VR or AR goggles to have a look at a digitally reconstructed version of the siege site which will be very useful uh, because by the time that that's finished and by the time that the new railway overpass is finished very little of that will remain to be seen. So we are currently walking roughly in the direction that the police first walked when they found out that the Kelly gang were in the Glen Rowan Inn. Um, it was a very open space because it had been fairly recently cleared and you can see in a lot of the photos and illustrations that there were tree stumps everywhere. Um, it was a very open battlefield. It was not somewhere there was a lot of places to hide. There was the odd tree of course but generally speaking um, it was mostly the cover of night that allowed the police to avoid getting shot. But where we're approaching now is a drainage ditch. And the reason that these bollards are positioned here um, in their very politically incorrect way, resembling Aboriginal men, uh, is this is approximately where Sub-Inspector O'Connor and his uh, troop of native police were stationed. They immediately took cover in, in this direction because it was sloping upwards where they were able to avoid being directly shot. You can see just over here some bollards done up to look like members of the Kelly gang in their armour. Um, that is the site of the inn which we'll get a look at in a moment but this gives you an idea of the kind of direction that most of the police initially were firing at but they actually as the siege increased in time uh, spread out all the way up around by, behind the end there and around the end this way um, basically encircling the inn the only place that wasn't uh, directly covered was the immediate rear of the inn because they were worried that the police bullets would go straight through the building and hit some of the police station on the other side so one of the things that I find really interesting uh, about portrayal of the native police at Glen Rowan, a lot of, they haven't really been shown in a lot of media. Um, there's, there's only two notable exceptions. There's the 1970 Ned Kelly film by Tony Richardson and uh, The Last Outlaw in 1980 also featured them at Glen Rowan. In both cases... Uh, they were portrayed in uniform, and that's also what we see here. Um, they were not in uniform. They were all plain clothes. Um, in fact, when they were notified that they were heading up to this way, um, they were actually getting ready to head back to Queensland. So they were sort of dressed in civilian clothing, but they did have their weapons with them. Now, if I'll give you a bit of a look. One of the, uh, the trackers was wounded in the siege and um, I'll show an image here see if there we go so this is an illustration of the wounded tracker I believe it was Jimmy who was uh, wounded of course he um, wasn't really named in the press at the time he wasn't considered important enough to warrant being named even though he was a member of the police force and he was wounded in the course of the siege by one of the Ke Kelly gang so you would think that he would get a bit more of a, a reputation for being something of a hero to the police but uh, of course as I know back in that time indigenous people were not considered very highly. It's also worth noting of course that uh, 
The trackers were entitled to a portion of the reward money for having been involved in the siege of Glen Rowan that resulted in the extermination of the Kelly gang. However, uh, they never received it because the Queensland government of the day took control of the money, uh, basically saying that they'll look after it for them and if they need it, then they can uh, apply to get access to the money. Needless to say, they never did. Even though some of their descendants have attempted to... Uh, get that money paid out. Uh, it's gone to court many times and never successfully. So what we're looking at here is the current overpass. Um, this overpass wasn't there at the time. This was added later to sort of make it easier for people to get over the railway line. But what we're standing in at the moment is what was considered the, uh, the railway reserve. It's the area in front of the inn where there was a whole bunch of uh, fencing and looking over here is where the front of the inn was now recently the replica of the inn sign was damaged uh, presumably by heavy winds uh, obviously not sturdy stuff but it is there in amongst all that long grass a lot of this grass has just gotten out of control because of the intense rain that we've had here recently uh, which resulted in a lot of flooding in a lot of areas up this way most notably in Seymour um, but yeah over a hundred and something years ago there was uh, buildings on this site um, after the Glen Rowan Inn burnt down um, there was later buildings built on top of it including a wine shanty that Anne Jones ran herself because the police kept uh, rejecting her application to set up an inn where she could sell spirits. So we're going to have a little bit of a wander, um, see if we can get ourselves down to a spot that most people don't bother going to. Um, I am looking both ways as we cross the road. Um, it's pretty quiet at the moment, seeing as most of the attractions for the town have closed for the day. Um, I'll see if I can turn this camera around. All right. So where we're heading now is down to, you can, some of you keen-eyed people might be able to see something poking out from under that bush, that tree. Um, there's a marker here which indicates where the gatehouse was. So this is where the Stanistreets lived uh, at the time. And all right, here we go. I don't know if you can see that a bit more clearly now. The gatehouse. Here we go. So this indicates where approximately there was a building. Because back in those days they didn't have automated boom gates. It meant that uh, if anyone wanted to get across here and the gates were closed, the station master had to specifically open them himself and Stanis Street had to do that on many occasions to allow Kelly sympathisers through. Some of them uh, apparently were quite threatening towards him and they'd rock up at all hours of the night demanding access across the railway. So this whole area was uh, just dirt with a train track basically running through it. That overpass wasn't there, that was all level, there was a level crossing and so when uh, Dan, when Ned and Steve arrived to try and pull up the tracks and they couldn't succeed after they'd gotten the, uh, the quarrymen out, um, they made their way across to Stanis Street to try and get him to direct them how to pull up the train tracks. And unfortunately for them, Stanis Street didn't know how to do it. Now... This brings up something that uh, I think is really important to note. There's been a bit of controversy around the, uh, the rebuilding of a bridge to allow for larger freight trains to pass through and for people to cross over the tracks safely. Now, there was a long consultation period. Uh, it seems as though the consultations went nowhere. Um, the new bridge that they'll be building will basically run across where I'm currently standing. Uh, it will extend from ooh, where are we? here. So this whole area at the back of the animated theatre will be removed 
and that will be the sort of the on ramp for the, the overpass. It'll come right across and it will end about midway up the siege site. What that means is that it will be higher, it will be larger and uh, most importantly for us who are interested in the history that means it will be built right on top of a huge section of the battlefield from 1880. Now it's considered that it won't have any real impact on the heritage of the site because the only part of this area that is considered the heritage site is the block of land where the inn used to stand. Um, everything else is just considered kind of optional. Um, but for people like myself who have studied this incident, it is a bit of a blow uh, because it does mean that the area is less accessible to people in many ways and a lot of that history is just being built over the top of that uh, it's Australia in a nutshell, nothing sacred. So around about here is where the Stanner Street house was back in the day and what a lot of people don't seem to realise is that this was actually a part of the siege uh, from the very outset. This is where Steve Hart was left in charge of the women and children. Ned and the other gang members were all the way up there having a good old time drinking and playing games with the male prisoners and uh, Steve was left down here with the women and children basically occupying his time by drinking copiously. It's worth mentioning that uh, even though Steve had gotten horrendously drunk um, according to Mrs Stanner Street he sobered up very quickly. Um, at one point he was napping on their couch with his pistols across his chest just in case anyone wanted to try anything on but uh, after Ned and Joe left with a small group to try and bail up Bracken Steve took the opportunity to take all of his prisoners across from the gatehouse up to the inn um, not seeing a reason why he should be left to stay down there but when Ned returned Steve was forced to come back just in case the train arrived and there was someone interfering with the signals. So you can see here the uh, approximate site of the inn and you can see it sort of extends quite a distance back and about where that big tree is there is where the new overpass will roughly end. So it goes quite a way in and for those in the viewing tower, it's obviously going to obstruct their view of the battlefield in the uh, augmented reality thing that they're setting up. So that's a bit of a disappointment, but such is life. So we're going for a bit of a wander along the uh, siege site at the moment, and I'm going to try and take you around the back a little bit. It's 27 degrees here in Glen Rowan at the moment so summer has arrived um, big change from a few weeks ago when it was torrential rain and floods but uh, that's how it goes down this way so uh, you learn to roll with it I suppose you can see lots of uh, long grass now about here is where the kitchen for the Glen Rowan Inn was that burnt down as well and where those buildings are up behind the fence is roughly where there was um, some outbuildings. There was a stable and what I believe was an outhouse. So, in the early stages of the siege, Ned was injured and uh, he never stood foot in the inn after the firing started, as attested to by many witnesses. And uh, it's believed that he attempted to saddle his horse, or specifically Joe's horse, music. She got spooked by the gunfire and bolted and it would have been out in this direction where she did that and Ned followed suit. Up along here is another little spot that people don't usually venture to which is associated with the siege because the police um, by the end of the siege had positioned themselves all the way up here to ensure that people couldn't escape. It's 
So, in this uh, scrubby looking block of land over here, uh, we'll be able to have a bit of a look at a spot where some of the police were positioned and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it later became a paddock for the police to put their horses in. So here we are, there's a scout building and yeah, in here was um, where a bunch of the police were positioned. There's a view uh, from over the other side of the train tracks. You can see Mount Morgan there up here and so we're about here so after the siege this was later turned into a paddock where the police could put their horses now from the police paddock you can see here they were firing downhill towards the inn now they weren't directly behind the inn but all these stories of Dan and Steve escaping um, you saw that all the front was protected by the police and the police had a view all the way back here and on the other side where we're going to go to in a minute it would have been extremely difficult for a couple of people to sneak out of a building that was surrounded in this way by so many people without being spotted but some people will believe anything so this is the rear of the uh, in sight so yeah, down there is where the inn was. And uh, there were no police positioned in this approximate spot because it was believed that the bullets from the Martini Henry rifles would come straight through the inn and its outbuildings and hit police on this side and vice versa, hit the people down, down the hill. But what we're going to do now is have a bit of a wander up this way a little bit to what has been Nicknamed the Kelly Cops, which sounds like a really weird thing, but um, it is supposedly the location of the uh, Cops of Trees where Ned uh, collapsed after he had escaped from the inn in the early hours of the morning of the 28th of June. All right, so we just had a bit of a walk down this way, which uh, wasn't super because there's no footpath there. But uh, we are now at the spot known as the Kelly Cops. Come around this way, you can see the sign behind me. There we go, Kelly Cops. Now this is supposed to be the approximate location where Ned passed out. Oh, train's coming. You can see it in the background there. Um, yeah, so after Ned went out of the inn, he was bleeding heavily, he was probably sleep deprived and drunk. Um, he initially passed out briefly at a fallen log, which we'll get to, and then once he was alerted to the sound of police coming up to where he was currently lying down, he crawled away into the bush here. Now, to give you an idea of where we are, just over there is where the train station is, just through there is where the inn was and this is where the cops was. Now Sergeant Steele and his party came from Wangaratta on horseback a couple of his police came down by train once the line had been repaired a little bit. Um, they came down from this direction so uh, on horseback coming down here. Now according to Ned he was so close to where they came past on their way to the back of the inn that he could have reached out and touched them as they passed. And Steele said himself that they heard the jangling of metal but they assumed it was a stirrup iron. Now that means that when Steele and his party set up positions around here, stopping people coming out the back of the inn, uh, there was no way for Ned to get back in. So the idea that Ned Return to the inn to see Joe Byrne be shot is not really something that holds water once you account for things like that. And all of the witness inside the inn who said that Ned never stood foot inside the inn again once the firing had commenced. But this is approximately where Ned passed out. Now obviously there are stories that he also went out deeper into the, the bush 
and sort of out, you know, beyond the hills to try and warn his army of sympathisers to turn back. Um, there's no evidence of that. Uh, there is evidence that there were armed sympathisers nearby because they were spotted the following day. Um, but the whole idea of there being a sort of army of sympathisers waiting to join Ned uh, is mostly relying on uh, what we would call in the business as hearsay. Um, but it is a story that was handed down through some of the sympathiser families over the years. So as we walk down this way, we are roughly uh, following the route that Ned took after he awoke on that fateful June morning. It is said by some that he fought the police single-handedly for over an hour or a half an hour or 15 minutes. No one seems to be entirely sure. But this rivulet was definitely there at the time and is visible in some of the photos and you can see through the grass there a hunk of metal which is meant to represent Ned's body armour. So as we come around this way we'll have a look at the grass here. Oh look at that grass, isn't it pretty grass? And you can see here where people have trampled the grass to try and get a look at the monument because of course they would like to see what's written on the plaque. It says here, the early on the cold winter morning of Monday, June 28th, 1880, the seriously wounded Edward Ned Kelly finally fell at this place and was captured, brought down by Sergeant Steele's double-barreled shotgun fired from across the nearby creek. So, Steele would have been somewhere over there, presumably. And this used to have a helmet attachment, uh, which I believe lasted only a few days before someone stole it. Because, in Glen Rowan, that's how it goes. Now, there is a bit of a uh, question about where exactly the spot was. Now, it's believed that there was a big fallen white ghost gum log uh, where Ned fell. It was preserved for a long, long time. There are many photos of it. And... Uh, it's estimated this is the spot where Ned fell. However, um, I tend to believe that it may have been a little bit closer to where that building is. Now that building was the Glen Rhyme Police Station which was built much later. Why would you build a police station right there? Well let's say that it's uh, the spot where a famous foe of the police was finally caught and brought to justice. Wouldn't you want to build the kind of headquarters, uh, the landmark associated with your group on that very spot? Perhaps to stop others from coming and uh, sniffing around looking for a bit of reflected glory or something like that by pinching a piece of the log? There is a photo that uh, I have had access to, which seems to show the log yeah, around about there. And uh, a photo that was taken on the day of the siege, after Ned was captured. Uh, I tried to re recreate that a little bit by standing in the spot where everything lined up with this mountain range. And uh, it was basically here, where this building is. So that's why I tend to believe that where Ned actually fell was basically on the site of the uh, later police station. Now it is worth noting, of course, how close Ned got to the inn as he was wandering, staggering, heavily wounded and dazed. It's not entirely sure where he was heading. Uh, some believe he was heading back to the train station. Some believe he was heading back to the inn. Others believe he was just blindly unloading his pistols at the police, hoping that they would hope, kill him in the act of uh, taking out as many of them as he could. Who's to say? But what is to say is that just over there, behind the old blacksmith shop, is where the Glen Rowan Inn was situated. 
and it takes about two minutes to walk from where Ned Kelly was captured to the inn. So either he got very, very close or he was never very far away to begin with. But at any rate, perhaps that's the ultimate tragedy of his last stand is that he was so close to freedom or at the very least a reunion with his surviving gang members when he was captured. Now, I'm not going to say that the battle sites are hallowed ground or anything like that. They're hardly anything like that. They're not holy in any way. But they are a significant part of not only our nation's history, but also its cultural heritage, because the Kelly story is such a deeply embedded part of the national identity, for better or worse, and nothing is associated with Ned so strongly as what happened here at Glen Rowan. Whether or not you believe he was attempting to launch a republic or simply kill as many police as he could in one go, the reality is that the image of Ned in his armour fighting the police coming out of the bush here at Glen Rowan is something that has really endured through over a century in Australia and has inspired many people to do many things ranging from as minor as getting tattoos to as major as getting involved in politics I suppose. There's something about the idea of that place and that time that really resonates with people and that's why I got interested in the story. Coming here as a boy uh, about the age of 12 and learning about Ned Kelly for the first time was a mind-blowing experience. I'd never heard of anything like that before, really. And discovered that it was pretty much on our doorstep. There was a place that we could go to, and there's, there were things there that we could touch and we could see and we could connect with that showed that this was all real. It wasn't a fairy tale. It was a huge awakening for me, and in uh, recent years it's led to all sorts of different things. But, ultimately, what I hope that this video achieves is a document showing something of the area where it all took place while it was still possible to access pretty much the entirety of it. But, for now, I'll, uh, I'll wrap it up there. And, um, I think I've earned a bit of a drink because it is blooming hot out here at the moment. So, thank you all very much for watching. Thank you all very much for taking the time to learn a little bit about the history. And uh, if you're interested, you can hop over to uh, my website, my Facebook page for Glen Rowan, uh, where you can learn a little bit more. Or you can buy my novel, Glen Rowan, which dramatises all of those events in 1880 and in the months beforehand. Alright, thank you.